Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to all of you to this session of the Aspen Security Forum Global Leaders Program. We're very happy to have you here for what promises to be a fascinating conversation with President Akufo Addo of the Republic of Ghana. He needs very little introduction. I'll do very short intros of him and of Jendai Fraser, our moderator, and then let them take it away. So His Excellency President Akufo Addo is the fifth president of Ghana. He was first elected in 2016 and was just sworn into office for a second term in January of 2021. He is a lawyer by training and in during his distinguished career undertook many important constitutional cases which protected the independence of the judiciary, the right of citizens to demonstrate and supported a free press and freedom of speech in Ghana. He also served as Attorney General and Minister of Justice from 2001 to 2003, and Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2003 to 2007. And President Akufo Addo, we're so happy to welcome you here, and we look forward to hearing everything that's going on in your great country. I have some close friends who live there, including David Ajay, one of your great architects. I really look forward to hearing from you and everything that's going on with COVID, with the vaccines, and with your economic growth. To interview you today, we have an old friend of both of ours, uh, Jendai Fraser. She is currently a distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. She and I have known each other through Stanford for many, many years. And of course, was also the US Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Special Assistant to the President for African Affairs, and served as the first woman US Ambassador to South Africa. So without further ado, Jendai, please take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anya. And Mr. President, welcome to you. It's a great pleasure to see you. Um, as always, uh, you're looking very well. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it's beautiful in Ghana right now. I'm told that all the time. So uh, welcome welcome to, to the, the globe, really, because we have participants from all over the world. Um, we can jump right into questions, but I understand you might want to make a few remarks first. Yes, OK. So first of all, I want to thank the Aspen Institute for inviting me to speak at one of America's most celebrated centers of thought and intellectual endeavor. It's an honor to be able to join you and to see so many people eager to discuss the future of my country, Ghana, and Africa more broadly, COVID-19 notwithstanding. And I'm particularly happy to see you, good friend, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Jendai Fraser, and you're looking also very hale and hearty. I arrived back in Ghana a few minutes ago after having taken a short trip this morning to our neighbor to the north, Burkina Faso, in my capacity as current chair of the Authority of Heads of State and Government of ECOWAS. The reason for this trip cannot be lost on you. A few days ago, 160 people were killed in an attack in a town in northern Burkina Faso. No group has so far taken responsibility for this cowardly act. Unfortunately, the perpetration of such acts in the region are becoming the norm, and we in West Africa have to ensure that we're not overrun by such turn of events. Over the years, we've all learned, all of us on this planet, that terrorism and violent extremism are not restricted to particular geographic locations or jurisdictions. We know that the impact of a single terrorist incident in one part of the world resonates throughout the rest. Unfortunately, in recent years, West Africa has become sadly a hotbed of terrorist and extremist activities and acts of piracy because the groups operating in the Lake Chad Basin, the northeast of Nigeria, the Greater Sahel and Mali, and the Gulf of Guinea are becoming more and more active. And these, this demands that we enhance the collaboration of security actors within the region. And in several meetings of the CISA, that is the Committee of Intelligence and Security Services of Africa, and the, quant the quintet meetings of what has now come to be known as the Accra Initiative, 
grouping together security and intelligence heads from Ghana and her four neighboring countries, i.e. Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Togo, and Benin, have been held and they are enabling us to review and formulate joint strategies towards combating these shared threats on terrorism and violent extremism. We of in Ghana, while supporting the regional and continental initiatives in this regard, we in Ghana have stepped up our own efforts to avert an occurrence of a terrorist attack on our soil, especially at the northern frontier, which borders Burkina Faso. We now developed for the first time a national security strategy. Um, the principal aim of it is to protect, uh, is to strengthen and protect our prevention, protection, and response capabilities. We've also formulated the counterterrorism policy and established a unit within the National uh, Security Council Secretariat to lead and coordinate our fights, our efforts in this fight. Is an area also of increasing concern to us, and that is the maritime insecurity within the Gulf of Guinea. The data from the International Maritime Bureau tells us that in the first quarter of, 19, of 2021, the Gulf of Guinea accounted for nearly 43% of all reported cases of piracy in the world. And last year, 2020, 95% of crews that were kidnapped on the seas. Indeed, a few weeks ago, there was an attack on a Ghanaian registered tuna vessel, tuna fishing vessel. The pirates, on raiding the vessel, kidnapped five expatriates, disembarked, and have since disappeared. The navies and the state security agencies of Ghana and Nigeria are working together to hunt for the pirates and the, uh, ex and the kidnapped expatriates. And it tells you this development about the seriousness of the maritime insecurity that is confronting us in, in, the, in, in the Gulf of Guinea at the moment. We have a, a problem, a logistical problem. The, the, vote, the, the equipment we need, the maritime structures we need that will enable us to maintain our vessels in the, uh, in the, in the Gulf for 72 hours and more is not there. So we're having to work extra hard with very limited resources to, to strengthen the capability of our Navy. And also at the same time pushing very strongly for a regional strategy to tackle effectively the menace of piracy. We know what the root causes of it are. It is widespread poverty and dissolution amongst the youth. The same phenomena that has led lots and lots of young people to cross the Sahara on foot uh, attempt in rickety boats to traverse the Mediterranean looking for allegedly greener pastures in Europe. Not only is it fueling that, this illegal mass migration, but it's also, of course, providing a fertile ground for generating a new generation of terrorists. So as we're looking at the security measures that are required to put in place to confront the physical aspect of the problem, we are also having to ramp up and scale up the development uh, priorities and, uh, and policies that we need to put in place. One of them is a, a phenomenon that has now come into being on the 1st of January this year, and that is the trading within the African Continental Free Trade Area. We're lucky, we've been honored with the hosting the Secretariat of, of, the, of the AFCFTA. The AFCA presents a truly novel, unique opportunity for us on the continent, in our own country and on the continent, to make a big fist of developing the economies of our country. 1.2 million people constitute the market within the AFCFTA. The collective uh, GDP of the 54 nations within it is, three, is some three and a half trillion United States dollars. So if we can get um, the pieces in place that will enable us to scale up trading amongst ourselves within the, the continental free trade area, it would make a major dent in the issue of poverty on the continent and help us 
promote the transformation of our country. That is the, uh, our major concern, the industrial transformation of our nation. And that is the major preoccupation of the government. And we have got several government initiatives that uh, are, are the bedrock of, this, of, 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 of the transformation process. We've given them all kinds of names, but these are uh, planting for food and jobs, uh, uh, planting for food and export. We are also involved seriously modernizing our ports and, and rationalizing the methods. So all of this is intended to position our country and the economy as a manufacturing hub of our region. We think that these are the pro that will enable Ghanaian enterprises to participate fully in the AFCFTA and enable us um, strengthen our market, boost our production, and particularly expand uh, rapidly our economy and thereby be able to produce more and more jobs for the young people. We see that as a way forward for our future. And in the process, of course, we're having to deal with this pandemic that has hit all the countries of the world, your own in America, uh, not excluded. Um, the major problem we're, we're facing at the moment is the vaccine shortage for us in Africa. Because we are not prepared, because we don't have the capacity to produce our own vaccines, we're having to depend on the on international, if you like, let me call it charity, to get. And so far, uh, the, the countries that have the capacity to produce are understandably you know, concerned with their own. But nevertheless, I think it is important that we all understand that the nature of the pandemic is such that it cannot be seen to have passed if there are parts of the globe that are still open and susceptible to it. It's one of these situations, they are rare in human history, but they are the, it, it's true. We have to rise together. Just as the pandemic hit all of us at the same time, we also have to find a way of getting up together. And that's why today I'm encouraged by some of the pronouncements that have come to, from the G7 meeting that is taking place about the determination of the, the, the rich nations of the world to address this issue of vaccine inequality and um, uh, access that we are confronting at the moment. I think that it is going to be the indication that there is perhaps a new uh, uh, paradigm, hopefully, in world affairs that underlines solidarity, that underlines uh, cooperation, and not so much the go-it-alone uh, attitudes that we have seen, have, have heard about in recent times. So this is um, a very brief snapshot of the problems that we are confronting in Ghana today, but we're doing so with one very important condition. And that is our determination to continue as a functioning democracy, as a country where democrat, the principles of democratic accountability, respect for the rule of law, respect for human rights, continue to be the centerpiece of the body politic of our nation. Ghana is today held up as a beacon of, of peace, of stability on the continent and of democracy. I believe that the two are closely intertwined, and that the, 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 the stability of the Fourth Republic that we have seen these nearly 30 years is intimately tied up to the fact that it has been the most democratic of the four republics that we have had in Ghana. So the con that, is the over that is the overall context in which the Ghanaian people are today attempting to address their problems of development. The, uh, the, in, the, in the course of the Fourth Republic. We've had three changes of government in Ghana through the ballot box, and it been done in conditions of peace and of, 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 of popular engagement. The last is the one that brought me to office in 2017, where when the election of 2016, the incumbent government lost at the polls, and we came in. Fortunately for me, um, and the last election in 2020, 
the people renewed my mandate and that of my party. So it would appear that the, there is some degree of satisfaction about the work that we're doing. But there is so much more to do, and that is where we are now. But I'm very happy to be speaking to you again, Jendai. And uh, we haven't seen you in Accra for some time. I know the COVID has something to do with it. But now that everybody's getting vaccinated, we hope we're going to see you very soon again here. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, what I'd like to do is maybe just ask a few questions um, and make sure that we leave enough time for our audience participation as well. And I'm going to start where you ended with democracy um, and then go through just as you did COVID uh, and um, the economy, the AFCTA, and then the security challenges. Um, so maybe four quick questions um, that you can answer somewhat briefly, but not too briefly. We want to hear from you um, so that we can get to the audience as well. Um, on democracy, let me just say you ran, I think you first started running for president in 2012. And you have been, um, you're on, I think you're on mute. I can't hear you. There we go. I got you. Yeah, it's 2008. Even earlier. <laughs> Yes, even earlier. My first attempt was in 2008, unsuccessful. Again in 2012, unsuccessful. And finally in 2016, it went through. And then in, in, in 2020 again. Um, now we're and coming 2020 up to, again. And then we're coming up to 2024. Uh, and Ghana has term limits. And so what will you do after this term? What do you want your legacy to be as president? And what is your plans after you leave office? The main legacy, of course, is to have been seen to have made a serious contribution to the transformation of our nation. Um, that that it, hopefully, that it will be said that it was in the Kufuado's time that the foundations were laid for the prosperous Ghana that will emerge in this decade and future decade. That is my biggest concern, um, and also that in my period that democratic institutions in Ghana were consolidated and um, became truly, truly um, embedded in the body politic of our, of our country. I believe that if, if I'm able to achieve these two goals, uh, it, it will be a very, there will be big achievements and, and I'll, I'll go off uh, in, in four years' time very happy with myself and uh, hopefully I'll write some books perhaps and devote the last few years of my time to, to, to yes, uh, recounting what I've gone through and, and, these, uh, and contributing to the, the, the thoughts and, 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 and intellectual discourse of, of, of our country and, and of Africa. Well, we certainly would hope that you would continue to put your great skills of leadership to peacemaking and peace building on the continent as well. There's always uh, a, a strong need there. Now, you did say, you know, the, the transformation of the economy, uh, Ghana's economy GDP growth from 2017 when you took office until first quarter of 2020 when the pandemic hit was going up 7% GDP. After the pandemic, um, you also had single digit in inflation, you had reduced fiscal deficits. After the pandemic, the 2020 rate has to be revised from 6.8 to about 0.9%. So it's taking right. a real impact on your economy. Yet at the same time, Ghana's numbers are really quite good uh, comparatively. There are 94,000 cases of COVID and only 787 deaths uh, so far reported. Um, what accounts for these low numbers? First of all, I think we took the pandemic seriously from the get-go. And therefore, the measures that, now, that have become common in the world, uh, the shutting down of spaces, the closure of airports, all of those things, were things that we were some of, among some of the, uh, the, the first nations in the world to do. Right from the very beginning, we saw uh, the, the dangers involved in the pandemic and that then they needed to take specific measures to try and control it. Um, so that, I think, is the first thing. The second thing is we were able to communicate the seriousness of the, of, of the situation to our population. Uh, 
and therefore was able to were able to buy in the support of the population for these measures, difficult and awkward that they, they have been. Um, I believe that there are also exogenous factors, the youth of the population, um, which have also helped uh, bring the numbers down. But the disciplines that we, that, that we imposed upon ourselves right from the outset, I think are largely responsible for the ability to control the, 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 the spread of the pandemic and keep it within low numbers. Today, what would be the, the, uh, the next stage of our, is of course, the vaccine. So far, we've been able to vaccinate some one million people. Our target is to try and vaccinate 20 million people by the end of this year, by the end of 2020, which is very essentially vaccinating the adult population of the country. We're 31, 30 to 31 million people and to the 21, 20 million represent the adult uh, part of the population. So that's our first target, to try and uh, vaccinate the adult population. And so far, we have been able to vaccinate one million people. But, and we have got caught up in the vaccine shortages that are going around in the world. But we're hoping that very soon, that some of the decisions that are being taken, the window is going to be open for us to be able to, to have access to many more, much more of the vaccine and meet our target of vaccinating 20 million people. We are lucky in the sense that um, we have a good infrastructure, a uh, good health infrastructure for vaccinations. We're used to vaccinations in Ghana for yellow fever, for cholera, for polio, and even uh, for the time of the um, um, uh, il, uh, Ebola. Yeah, we, so the, the, the structures are well set up here in the country, and that is what has allowed us to be able to, to get us uh, this far in the vaccination process. Altogether, some 12 million people, I think, have been vaccinated on the continent, and uh, one million of them are here in Ghana. So it gives you an idea of the capacity of the Ghanaian state to be able to deploy the vaccines once we have them. Mr. President, you do mention the issue of the vaccine equity. Um, and this is an issue that's getting a lot of attention across Africa. Um, right now, I think the, if you think about therapeutics and diagnostics and vaccines, more than 90% comes from outside the continent. And so manufacturing on the continent and having more um, diverse distribution um, is, is absolutely critical, but yet, in 20, 2001, African countries committed to putting 15% of their budget towards uh, global public health expenditure or domestic public health expenditure. Yet the reality is only about 1.9% of GDP actually goes to uh, domestic public health expenditure. So what will be different this time, um, really? The pledges can be made um, when you know the whole issue of local manufacturing of vaccines was very clear during the Ebola 10 years ago when the West Africa Ebola crisis happened, yet 10 years later, here we are again. Um, do you I think it's been very different this time? Well, I think that first of all, I mean, what, what happened, and I think that there's some, the, the, an element of it is quite human. Once the Ebola crisis went down, the, it went down the, the, the impetus, the urge, to, to continue the process of, 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 of deepening our, our capacity to manufacture our own vaccines also ebbed. And that was a major error on our part. I think that today, especially with the dependence that has been exposed on our part on foreign supplies of these vaccines, the decision to go ahead and now manufacture locally has been taken. Uh, South Africa is very committed to it. Rwanda is very committed to it. In West Africa, Senegal and as well as ourselves are the two countries that have publicly committed to it and are actively working on it. So I, I suspect that the the scare and the, and the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic um, brought into all of us has, has, has uh, really deepened and, uh, our determination that this time round, 
we are going to be able to uh, go ahead. Because really, the situation in which we find ourselves now uh, is completely unacceptable. Uh, we know that there's, some, there's something that we need to have, and we can't have it because we have not prepared ourselves to have it. I don't think that that is a situation that we would want to see repeated again in, in this generation. So to that, to that extent, there's a, a mindset that is radically different from that, uh, that, that there was some 10 years ago. Um, the, uh, it, it was ephemeral. The, 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 the positions that were taken 10 years ago. I, I sense that this time around, the, the commitments are very much more solid and, 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 and reliable. We, we, you talked about the youth and the youthful population being part of the reason why um, Africa, especially, I mean, North Africa and Southern Africa have been hit pretty hard, particularly South Africa. Um, but that youthful population, and we, you know, moving to the question of your economy, 59% uh, of uh, Ghana's 31 million population is under the age of 25. Uh, so that really is gives you a demographic dividend. Um, and manufacturing, moving your economy towards greater manufacturing, definitely in the health sector, but more broadly, will create the jobs so that those young people don't become jihadists and insurgents. Um, to start where you started the conversation with the security threats across mm -hmm. the region. Um, so will you get partnership from, uh, you know, the major companies uh, that will you get the FDI to be able to move your economy from an informal economy to a manufactured based economy? You know, I think about many Western countries who would like to put their supply chains in Europe and in Asia and particularly in China, where there was low uh, wage uh, wages, which made it very competitive. Now Africa has the young people, has the lower wages. How do you attract that investment and how do you get those companies to consider Africa um, a real destination, not just to sell their products, but to actually manufacture those products? I think mean, there are several things that we're required to do. Um, I mean, first of all, to have governance systems that make sense. And that is why the whole democratic framework in which we're trying to build Ghana is so very important because it's important when uh, that, that, that people know when they put their money in our country that there are, there's a, a state structure and a system of laws that protect the investments and, make, uh, and, 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 and enable the investor to be able to reap his reward. Then there, are the, the, then there is the whole skill set to produce the, 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 the skills in the young population that would enable them to be able to take advantage of investments that, that come. And we're particularly focused on that in Ghana. We've instituted a system which we call the Free Senior High School mm -hmm. Policy, which has meant that, uh, unlike before, before I came into office, uh, senior secondary education in the public system in Ghana is free. Um, it, it, if you have the qualifications, you go to it, there's no burden on, the state has taken on the burden of, uh, and we want to do this for a gen at least a generation, if not more, to make sure that we have that critical mass of educated young people uh, who will be able then to take advantage of us. Again, the the digital revolution that is taking place in the world. It's, it's extremely important that we, we do not le get left behind in that, in, in, the, in that drive, because that is also the way in which the informal economies of, of Africa and of Ghana and Africa can be formalized and therefore make it easier, much, much easier to bring economic activities to the doorstep of ordinary people. So there are several things that we need to do ourselves to, to, to create the conditions that would enable people to say, oh yes, 
putting our money here and there. And, and we've seen that already. I mean, uh, many of the economists, or not many, but several of the economists of, of Africa before the pandemic struck were among some of the fastest growing economies in the world, attracting significant amounts of foreign direct investment, largely because the fundamentals of their economies and the way in which the economies were being managed made it possible for people to say, yes, we here are, if you like, safe havens for investment. And I believe that it is that um, uh, paradigm that we need to push on the continent. The uh, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, I think, as you mentioned earlier, is also critical here because part of the challenge of getting foreign direct investment is the fragmentation of the African continent, 54 countries, and the size of those economies. So bringing those economies together um, will make a big difference. Now, Ghana is the headquarters for the Secretariat. How did that happen? Um, a, a lot of up and down on my part in you know, Ghanaian diplomacy. We were determined. First of all, we had all these years, and despite the primacy of Ghana in the Pan-African movements and in the liberation struggle on the continent, we had never hosted a serious Pan-African organization before. So in 2017, when I came into office, I made it my target that whatever be the case, this particular organization, we're going to move mountains to bring it to Ghana. At the end of the day, um, I, I received a lot of support, obviously, from my peers on the continent, and we were able finally to, to make it happen. And I think also the, 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 the bid that Ghana made for it was, uh, was recognized as a, as, as a very respectable one, and one that showed the seriousness of our ability to host the Secretariat once it came. But the, the point, the bigger point that is being made is what you made, which is about about the size of our markets, the fragmentation of our of, of our economies as a result of larger, small countries, several fifty four million people, and today, the intra regional trade amongst ourselves, the trading amongst ourselves, represents something like 16% of our collective GDP. It's a very low figure. When you look at uh, what it is in Asia, what it is in Europe, I believe the European is, is, is something like 70 to 75% of, Euro, uh, of, of, of Euro, the EU's collective GDP derives from trading amongst themselves. These figures are uh, 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 the same figures in, uh, in Asia and in, in, in the Americas. So that in itself provides us if we can get the elements in place, which is what was beginning to look like out of the f f continental free trade area, a very significant path towards greater activity, greater development, and of course, increasing prosperity. President, um, you have a number of partners. The United States has been a very strong partner to Ghana and to Africa in general, uh, in terms of the democracy, um, supporting the democratic progress of the continent, supporting supporting health. Um, we have of late not done as much on the economic side in terms of the private sector and investment. Um, I, I wonder if you could say something about you know this, this, this the models of China and the United States. Um, and I know that you know it's not a competition uh, from an African perspective. Um, but I, I would love to have your wisdom, and I know the audience would, about how do you see your engagement, your strong engagement with the United States and that approach, and your strong engagement with China and its approach? Uh, what wisdom can you share with us? Yeah, but I think, first of all, I mean, it's important for us to recognize, as far as we're concerned, we're not in a competition. We don't see anything as, it's, 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 we're not having to, to make choices. As, on a on a on a case by case case basis, the arrangements that we take are the arrangements that make sense for us. The biggest single economic deficit we suffer from is our lack of infrastructure internally in our countries, as well as externally in terms of the regions and the continent. You can take a rail, you can take a train from New York. And go to Los Angeles, 
You can't do that in, uh, in Ghana. You can't take a, a, a train here in Accra and end up in Addis Ababa. It doesn't exist. The same with roads. So the major focus of our economy has to be providing the infrastructure that will enable accelerated growth to take place. So we're looking at those who can assist us, can partner with us to do that. And the, um, I know there's a great deal of concern about the involvement of China in the economies of Africa. But largely it has been because the Chinese have been prepared to assist at that level. The quality of their assistance, how, how, how beneficial it is, has been. But initially, this was the drive that brought them onto the country. I, for myself, believe that um, the, the economies of the West, led by the United States, are equally capable of providing the same sort of service and, uh, and, 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 and asset development as we have seen from China. Um, I've been, but I'm not sure about the mindset so far because American involvement in, in, our, in, 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 in our continent has been, as you pointed quite rightly, the political support, the support in, the, in security areas. But the economic interaction between private sector operators in America and private sector's operators, for instance, here in Ghana, and that thing, has not been as... Uh, as, as intense as we would like to have it. The last major American investment in Ghana was made in Kwame Nkrumah's time, and that is the development of the Akosombo Dam when Edgar Kaiser came to an understanding with Nkrumah about the building of the dam as a, as a prerequisite for establishing the bauxite industry. Since then, we have not had any truly significant American involvement in the Ghanaian economy since then. And this is what we're looking for. We're, this is one of the things that I'm very anxious that we should be looking at with the private sector operators in the, and also, of course, with the new government that is taking place in Washington. Well, Mr. President, we're going to have to turn to Q&A, but let me just say that um, your greatest deficit on the continent is infrastructure, but your greatest asset is your youth. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Uh, and, and I would also say that, um, you know, I just want to thank you also for your emphasis on the diaspora, on the year of return, um, people really um, in the capacity to reach out and build that connection with the people, I think is absolutely the, the key to the future of the continent and the young people, especially. And uh, the, the diaspora connection is something that we, uh, we feel very strongly about in Ghana. I mean, our coastline is dotted with, with slave castles, and uh, it shows the involvement of Ghanaians in the whole of this horrific transatlantic strait. And I think that apart from anything else, uh, emotional and, and, and spiritual values make it very, very important for us to reach out again across the Atlantic and, and build that bridge that... Um, that, 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 that has to be, which will, will help those on the other side of the Atlantic as well as ourselves. I see, we see it as something that could be, would be very, very fruitful and something that would uh, also um, help strengthen both of us, this side of the Atlantic as well as on the other side of the Atlantic. So it's, it's a commitment that is very important for us. And I'm happy that the Beyond the Return initiative, which I announced uh, to the Black Caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus in, uh, in 2018 in, at the Press Club in Washington, um, paid such big dividends in terms of uh, the mobilization of world opinion and the numbers of people that came. Uh, we had, uh, we, we, our, by our data, over a million people responded to that call in the year 2019. So clearly it, it struck a, a chord and it's a chord we want to continue keep um, uh, developing. Thank you, thank you, sir. Let me turn it over to Anya. Thank you so much, Jendai, that was fantastic. And Mr. President, thank you for giving us such a great overview of all the things you're doing to push Ghana to a prosperous future and make it one of the fastest growing economies in Africa. We have a number of audience questions, but right before we turn to them, I'd like to just take moderator's prerogative and ask you 
You know, the Biden administration just this past week put out a big initiative on anti-corruption around the world. It's something that Jake Sullivan, who spoke to our group recently, has as one of his priorities. I know it's one of your priorities. You've done a lot to crack down on corruption, especially illegal mining. Can you just say a word about that? And then I think right next, we'll turn to John Frank, who's the vice president at Microsoft in government affairs. Yes, I mean, uh, it, it's being done at several levels. First of all, institutionally, strengthening the institutions that are responsible for, for confronting corruption in our countries. So we're talking about uh, the anti-graft anti institutions in Ghana um, have received more support from the central, from the treasury than they had received until I came into office. That is one. Secondly, um, Conf dealing directly with some of the of, 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 of the matters on the ground that could no longer wait, the destruction of our environment that, that was taking place as a result of illegal mining in, in Ghana. It's, it's, it was becoming something of horrendous consequences for us. Water bodies were drying up in the country, and all of this because a few people were were, were collaborating to to exploit the mineral wealth of our country by hook or by crook and largely by crook. So we've also taken a very firm position on, on that and it's, and it's ongoing the, 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 the fight against what we call galamse illegal mining. So there's a, and there's a whole broad framework of things that are taking place to make uh, yeah to make sure that um, we um, we, we create a, a condition for public accountability and for also the preservation of public assets. And one of them, of course, has also been that uh, a, a legislation that had been long, long delayed, that is the Right to Information Act, which you're familiar with in America. At long last, we've sought to its passage in my, in my first term so that the, the accountability of public officials for, how, for what they do and uh, to, 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 to the citizenry. It's something that is maintained at all times. Thank you. A very hard thing to change. And I'm glad you're making the start. We'll turn next to John Frank for Microsoft. Mr. President, um, honored to be with you. Uh, I want to raise the digital aspect of your economic development, um, and both in the context of domestic, but also the, the free trade area. Um, you have been taking steps to uh, increase uh, internet connectivity. Um, Microsoft, we, we made an investment with Blue Town in, in extending um, their low cost, affordable solutions through because you were able to open more spectrum um, for low cost solutions. But can you talk a little bit about your government strategy for, for digital services and internet access? And then secondly, as you think about the free trade, um, you know, I think it's incredibly important to think about um, the flow of data across borders, because some of the technologies today are at a scale where investing in major data centers or, or in um, under ocean um, cables um, you know, require larger uh, populations. So the free flow of data uh, as part of trade, even if it's just limited to um, you know, like the Accra Group or something like that, would would enable uh, scale uh, for digital development. Clearly, the first step was to make sure that the population were easily identified and identified in a digital manner. So we made. We made it possible now for 15 to 16 million Ghanaians, that is three quarters of the adult population of, of the country, to have uh, national identification cards, biometrically created national identification cards. And with that, the step of being able, therefore, to make sure that everybody has the, the, the access to social services through a digital process is very, very much ongoing here in Ghana. And it, the basis of it being the national identification card. Subsequently, properties are now also being 
digitally identified. We have a, a national property digital uh, identification process. So we are, uh, the government services are now digitalized. Uh, the workings of, 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 of the ports. We have several different programs of digital uh, expansion, which are all taking place at the same time and therefore getting us nearer and nearer a situation whereby it will be it's easy, connectivity uh, amongst us is easier and therefore also making it possible now to look at the larger connectivity that is required within the region and also the continent. Because at the, at the, at the basis of it for us here in Ghana is our own digital expansion. And that is something that is going at a very rapid rate in the country. And I'm sure you know it from your own experience and from the investment that you have made here in Ghana. But yes, you're dead right. We need to focus very seriously on how we can build the connectivity in our various countries and how we can. And I think that there are lots of initiatives that are taking place at this level on the continent that, yes, um, Google has come here, established its first artificial intelligence center here in, in, in Ghana over a year ago. Uh, Twitter has announced its determination to establish its Africa headquarters in Ghana. Uh, I had an opportunity to have a very uh, fruitful discussion uh, with uh, Jack Dorsey. Uh, uh, and so we're, we're seeing these developments taking place and they are accelerating in, 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 in impact and it's going to therefore create that ecosystem that will enable us to uh, this time round, God willing, that we don't lose out in this fourth industrial revolution that is taking place. Thank you. That's excellent progress. I think we have time for just one more audience question, and I'll call on Zain, Zainab Usman, who is the director of the program at Cornell. Yeah. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, Your Excellency, my name is Zainab Usman. Um, I'm uh, the director of the Africa program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace here in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, it is a pleasure to hear you talk about your inspiring vision for, for Ghana. Uh, my question is on Ghana's leadership role in Africa. So following on your country's successful bid to host the Secretariat of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, are there more plans uh, for Ghana to exercise leadership uh, on behalf of the continent globally? And I can think of three crucial areas here. Number one being climate change. Number two being um, uh, restructuring the development finance and debt architecture. And this is something you have recently written about and expressed certain views on. And then a final area is on reforming the UN Security Council. So do you have plans to exercise more leadership globally on behalf of the African continent on these areas? I think, I think, I think these are all areas of very, very great concern for us. There can be no doubt about it that the climate change issue is as relevant and is as pregnant in Africa as it is in any other part of the world. And um, uh, Ghana has made it clear uh, its commitment to, to uh, uh, what we need to do to establish a green future for ourselves. And it's done largely through the articulation of views that I do all the time to make it, and also the decisions that we have taken domestically, which are to be able to um, uh, make sure that our efforts to guard against climate change are, are, are successful. As far as the, uh, the debt situation in the world is concerned, yes, as you know, I, I, I've gone public. I was in, in Paris in 10 days, two weeks ago, when uh, at the meeting convened by President Macron with several of the, of the leaders of the continent to think about the, our position in the post-COVID uh, world. And the, 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 the clear conclusion that has come out is that the current structure of the, of the global financial architecture let me put it as simply as possible. It's not fit for purpose. 
for the 21st century. Because a major part of the concerns that it has to address, those are the concerns of development in Africa. It cannot, in its present situation, address it. For instance, there's an agreement that has been brought that the special drawing rights within the IMF system that uh, are now going to be reviewed is taking us to expanding the special drawers, drawing rights to something like 650 billion United States dollars, of which 33 billion is by the present system what is committed to Africa. It's, it's with respect, woefully inadequate to, conf to deal with the problems confronting the continent. We need to ex scale up that to at least $100 billion before we can say that we now are um, in a position meaningfully to deal with the issues of, of our continent. So yes, that is an area where we are playing um, a, a, as an active a part as we can. The finance minister of, of, of Ghana is co-chair of the African finance ministers group who are at, at the forefront of this conversation with the partners around the world. And it is a matter of very great concern for me. I'm finding, spending a lot of energy writing letters to all and sundry in the world, to Macron, to this, to that, to that, urging the African situation. So Ghana is very, very involved in that. And as far as the restructuring of the United Nations system is concerned, when I was foreign minister, we announced our interest and, and, and determination to play a role in that. Um, in fact, the famous Ezowini consensus that was formed to uh, establish Africa's common position on UN reform was chaired by me as uh, 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 in Winnie, so that um, Ghana's imprint on that is also something that is there as a matter of record. And we have not stopped urging the acceptance of the world community with the uh, the conclusions and recommendations of the Ezowini consensus as a way of bringing equity once again and, and relevance to the operations of the United Nations. Many of these global institutions that we're operating now were set up some 70 years ago after the Second World War. They've performed very well, not have any, they performed very well for the problems that were then and created subsequently to that to deal with. But 70 years ago, Africa was present in the world, but was not present in the decision making in those, we were a colonized continent, and therefore obviously would not have been present in Bretton Woods, would not have been present in San Francisco. We are present now, and therefore we need to have organizations that are, are, are structured in such a way that we can also make a valuable contribution to how these organizations work and deal with global problems. So, yes, um, Ghana is determined to do her bit in, in making sure that these issues, the climate change, the, the debt situation in the world and the restructuring of the global financial system as well as the reforms of the United Nations remain as on the front burners of, 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 of global, the global conversation as possible. Mr. President, thank you so much. That was a tour de force. Thank you for being with us. We'd love to welcome you back anytime. And it was great to hear about your ambitions to vaccinate 20 million Ghanaians by the end of the year, the environmental initiatives, your growth, economic growth, and everything you're doing to restructure international institutions to make them fit for purpose. Thank you very much for having me. But when I see the snow in the background of from where you're talking in Aspen, it's not real, it's virtual. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder about whether I can actually come to Aspen. It may be that. Conversations of this nature could be the, the, the way forward for you and I. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it very much indeed. Thank you. And to our audience members, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And we look forward to welcoming you virtually from August 3rd to 5th, where we have multiple heads of state, the Foreign Minister of India, and many others for our virtual Aspen Security Forum. And then we will be in person in early November. So look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Mr. President. Thank you once again.